Welcome everyone to our January Global Education Colloquium. Uh, my name is Christy Kelly and I'm a faculty member here at Drexel School of Education. Thank you to those of us joining us in person as well as those of you joining online. Um, we're very excited today to have uh, Dr. Hugo Ceron Anaya, who is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Lehigh University and this year taking over as Director of Latin American and Latino Studies, also at Lehigh. His work focuses on social hierarchies, inequalities, and privilege, examining how class, race, and gender inform the behavior and perceptions of affluent people. He's particularly interested in the wide array of ordinary and everyday practices that reproduce privilege. He's the author of a new book, I highly recommend it for all of you out there interested in privilege. It's called Privilege at Play, Class, Race, Gender, and Golf in Mexico, um, and it's through Oxford University Press. If this is your first time coming to a colloquium, welcome again. Um, we have people online as well as face-to-face. -face. At the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, for our speaker. So if you're online, please just chat your questions in and we'll read them out in the room. Uh, thank you. And thank you, people. Thank you very much. First, I would like to start by uh, thanking uh, Professor Kelly for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. So let me tell you something about I will divide this talk in four broader points. Uh, and the last point I would bring, I would sort of turn around the main re the, my research or the, the main themes of the book and then try to think alongside uh, why shall educators study the privilege. So first let me start. Uh, this is the cover of my book. Uh, and as you can see, and I hope that it is also good for those uh, watching online. You could see on the right, you have a, a, a fancy um, set of apartments, building, including some tennis courts, uh, pool, and so on. And then you have a tall wall. And then on the other side, you have an area for poor people. Since when I started this research, I wanted to understand uh, inequality, social inequalities. However, I realized that uh, sociologists, we have developed a strong body of work on this side of uh, society. We have sort of plenty of research analyzing uh, notions of uh, gender of the poor, analyzing the composition of the family, analyzing perceptions about uh, uh, money, wealth, etc., about the poor. However, we have relatively, relatively limited understanding on the other side, on the fancy side of the picture. We barely understand uh, these other groups, how they think about gender, how they think about wealth, how they think about class, uh, etc. So it seems that when we, the large body of work conducted on the poor seems to, in multiple cases, generate a uh, self-explained reason uh, to sort of make sense of poverty. So folks who are on this side, when we take the whole body of work, in some cases it seems that there's an implicit argument that those folks who are here are poor because they come from poor backgrounds, because they are in schools with limited resources, because their friends are folks with limited uh, resources, money, and so on. And <coughs> If you keep stretch, stretching the argument, but in some cases, the body of work looking at the poor and social inequalities in this country seems to imply that poor people are poor because they are poor. So it seems that we end up with an ontological argument that the poor are poor because they are poor, almost like a box in which poverty is explained through a self-contained uh, dynamic of poverty. However, when we think about these type of pictures, and I will even if you think about Philly, you will be able to, to, to have this feeling, this feeling, sorry. Uh, probably the area that I better know in the city is the South Philly uh, market. And there, walking around that area, I have had this very similar feeling walking around the area. Fancy new buildings, and then uh, half a block, you have a, a, a poor house, and so on. So when we think about that interaction, this self-contained idea seems to make no sense because when we think about this side of the of the picture someone needs to clean the pool someone needs to mow the lawn 
someone needs to train the trees and so on. And certainly, those guys doing all that work are not the owners of uh, those apartments, but the people living on the other side of the wall. So in multiple ways, I felt that in the sociology of inequalities in Mexico and at large in Latin America, I felt that they were telling half of the story. Uh, and that half of the story was or had to do with the poor. But they were barely telling the other part of the story that had to do with those uh, folks. And that, that was one of the main uh, aims I had when I started this project. I want to tell or do research on the other half to try to understand the relationship. So then I decided to conduct this study of project, trying to interview people. Um, however, as in many other countries, you cannot go and start asking questions about money. How much money do you have in your bank account? People will feel quite uncomfortable uh, by that question. Among other things, because of the latest crisis of insecurity, people will feel quite uncomfort comfort uncomfortable to reveal uh, their, their wealth. However, I knew that some private golf courses charge around $25,000 to become a member. So because I knew that in advance, I could avoid the question of how much money you have in your bank account, in your bank account if someone had $25,000 as a disposable income, it means that that even family belongs to the upper middle class or the upper class. No middle class person, even in the United States, will have that amount of disposable money uh, to join a social sport club. So at the very beginning, I was interested in understanding how class exactly manifest, manifests on a daily basis. How exactly people make sense of class? How do they reproduce it? How do they express it? It is through language, it, it is through the sense of fashion, it is through the way in which they talk about their holidays and so on. So it was quite interesting to that sort of little daily, even mundane, or what we may think even insignificant actions. I was interested in that. How is exactly that society reproduced through these very small uh, and everyday actions uh, in this uh, setting. However, the more I spent interviewing uh, male players belonging to these clubs, the more, the more I realized that it wasn't only about class. Class was one element. For example, I started realizing that women were not allowed to uh, spend time at the bar of uh, these clubs. You will barely see women there. The only women that you could see there were workers, uh, not members. Uh, However, I also knew that some of these women were wealthier than their husband, or, or their, their husbands. Actually, they were the ones who belonged to some of these clubs as uh, little uh, kids, and then eventually become older women, and then get married, and then they invited uh, the, the husband to, to join the community. So I knew that, and despite that, I started realizing that they were not accepted in these spaces, that they couldn't play at prime time, which usually in this sport, prime time is considered early morning weekdays. Why? Because people can go and start playing at 6.30 in the morning, and by 10 ish they finish the game, and they can be at their office around 10.30, almost 11. If you start playing at midday, that completely cuts your day. So prime time is considered early morning, and women were not allowed to play at this early morning. So suddenly, I start realizing that when I was trying to understand privilege and power, it was about class, but also it was about gender. It was about masculinity. It was about the way in which a wealthy individual expressed their sense of masculinity, which was very different from the way in which working class uh, people expressed their sense of masculinity. Uh, then the more I sp spent time with ma male and female members talking about class, talking about uh, how the, the, the communities are organized, talking about the cost of the sport, talking about their uh, understanding of why this sport is so expensive, which by the way, uh, in most countries of the world, this sport is only played at private settings. Uh, in the United States, you can play golf with a relatively uh, uh, few uh, income. You can still buy uh, use equipment and then during the summer, you can go to a municipal course after four or five, and you could pay only eight or nine dollars and play it. 
Uh, in the rest of the world, Europe included, uh, that's not the case. You are talking about a highly expensive uh, private setting. So that's the reason why I started doing this research, this research about golf. I'm not a golf enthusiast, I'm not a fan, so that was not what drove me to this sport. <laughs> what drove me was exactly to try to understand class inequalities uh, and privilege. Then at some point in the research, I also realized that I couldn't tell, I, and I couldn't understand this relationship between highly affluent individuals and the other side of the world if I, could, if I didn't include those individuals. If, if the, the analysis was going to try to unearth how inequality and privilege is organized, I required to talk to workers coming from the surrounding areas. And then I decided uh, to look at Cadiz and to include Cadiz uh, in my research. And first, I start asking members about why if, or let me roll about, about uh, let me mention something about Cadiz and then I will start talking about the questions I ask members and Cadiz. Uh, Cadiz, for those of you unfamiliar with the sport, are the workers who help uh, golfers while on the course, like these folks. They do uh, different type of activities. Uh, from just carrying the clubs to cleaning the clubs, helping golfers finding a ball that lands 100 yards away from when, when it was hit. Uh, they uh, share information between groups, they bring water, they bring food, from those very simple tasks to something more complex. These guys know a lot about the sport. They understand very well the sport, and in fact, some of them are really good golfers. Uh, so they also advise players on a strategy. Uh, I know that if, if you are not familiar with the sport, this may seem very basic, like just keep the ball and so on, there's no strategy. As any other sport, including running, cycling, if you practice a, at a high competitive level, it requires a degree of strategy. So these guys understand the sport and they can advise players on strategy to be more uh, aggressive as a player, to be more conservative, uh, and so on. Now, in all the courses that I visited, uh, they have caddies. Like in the United States, in which only exclusive clubs uh, have caddies, in this setting, every single club, because all of them were private uh, and catering for the upper middle class, they have caddies. Um, and then starting, I started talking with the caddies as well while I was starting talking with, the, with, with uh, golfers. And then I realized that these folks, as I mentioned, they understood the, or they understand the sport very well. They are very good uh, players and some of them actually are amazing players. They could even compete in professional leagues uh, based on their uh, playing uh, skills. And then I start asking members, why is it that there are so many caddies and actually some of them play so good that they could become professional players but not a single one of them is competing in top leagues in the world. Well, of course, my question was, I was not interested in their views and ideas about professional golf, uh, because I'm not a golfer, I'm not a fan. My views were, I was trying to understand, what do you think these people are poor? That was what I was trying to ask and understand by asking about why they are not becoming professional players. And then I started hearing all these sort of common narratives about poverty. Do you know what? These guys have no work ethic. These guys are lazy. Uh, they prefer fast money and so on, sort of traditional narratives. And suddenly I hear Johnny's story, and I think to me that sort of encapsulate the relationship between privilege and those at the other side of uh, the dynamic, the underprivileged. Let me, Johnny, tell, me tell you Johnny's story to try to, to capture um, or unearth the way in which these two groups are deeply related. So while I was asking members, tell me why these folks, and knowing that some of them are so good, are not becoming professional players. And then suddenly a member told me, just me about that, let me tell you the story about Johnny. And of course, I'm changing names, but he was referring to someone in specific. Johnny started working in this club, the member told me, at a really young age, because his father also works here. Uh, so as a teenager, he was playing, and then suddenly became, in his late teens, early 20s, as an amazing player. He was playing scratch, which in the world of uh, golf means that you play 
the game in the perfect number of, uh, assume perfect number of strokes, uh, which means that you're an extremely talented player. So Johnny was playing scratch. He was this amazing player. And then someone convinced him to start playing in the local Mexican professional league, the member told me. So he started playing there. Then after a couple of years, do you know what? He dropped the league. He dropped his dream of becoming professional. And you will find him here playing little tournaments and being the instructor. Uh, and the member went on. Do you know what? That sort of reflects perfectly well that these people are have no ambition in life. These folks are happy with the a little money that they're making. Uh, these people do not have the uh, nutrition, and I will return to the nutrition in, in a second uh, to make it in life. Uh, and that's the reason why they don't make it. Then I move and I start asking Cadiz the same question. Why is it that you don't, or some of you, despite being extremely talented players, don't make it into professional leagues? And I was thinking particularly the US league in which you can make a lot of money. And then suddenly a guy told me, let me tell you the story of my friend Johnny to sort of show you what's going on. And he was talking about the same uh, individual which the member assumed he's lazy, no work ethic, no ambition, and that's the reason why he's uh, poor and back where he started. And he told me, Johnny was, and then he went on the same story, started really young, learned the, the game, and became a really good player. Moved to the professional league. Then he realized that this is a very expensive sport. You need a sponsor behind you. Why? Because the Mexican league is not, it may not give the amount of money that you find in the, in the US league. However, the level of elitism is still there. You cannot go to a tournament uh, or, or tour around the country by bus. You need to fly because you need to be rested. You cannot go to a, say, Cancun to play a, a tournament and then sleep in a cheap hotel. You need to sleep in the facial hotel. Why? Uh, because you need to be where the action is. You need to go down at the bar because you never know where you will sit down next to an important executive who may offer some help uh, and so on. So Johnny, early on, realized that he needed to invest all his uh, uh, economic uh, prices into his career for about a couple of years, three, four years, to see if after those three years of uh, playing uh, really good winning tournaments, he may be able to jump to the uh, second tier league in the United States. Then invest two, three, four years maybe to see if he can jump where the money is. If you are part of the working class, you cannot do that. You don't have the economic security. You don't have the support. Nobody's behind you. And if you have a family, forget about it. It is extremely risky uh, path to follow. And then suddenly, this player reveal a world that for the members was completely hidden. Whereas for them, Johnny's decision was a proof that, that, that Cadiz have no work ethic and no ambition in life for a Cadiz dropping his dreams of becoming professional and going back to his club and then giving some training was the most rational decision to make. Any rational individual will make that decision uh, if he fight, faces uh, this long, long uh, way to see if you can eventually make it into the professional league. So that takes me to the idea of privilege and how privilege requires to hide its sources of advantage at all costs. And this is something that I start uh, the more I spend time with these uh, players, interviewing them, spending them with uh, time in their clubs and so on, I start realizing the way in which they were hiding the privilege that actually constituted the whole uh, set. One of the things I realized is that I couldn't pay my own expenses. When people were inviting me for an interview, and sometimes I have dinner with them, lunch with them, have a couple of drinks, and I was trying to pay my expenses in order to keep a the illusion that we were in the same uh, uh, level field. Uh, and then early on I realized that, that I couldn't because money doesn't circulate within these clubs. You sign your bill. And then at the end of the month, your bill is charged with a credit card. So there's a way in which money gets removed from uh, the site as such if money doesn't matter. 
to, to, to be part of this community. And they indeed, very few of them insisted on the issue of money, and most of them, when I was asking what constitutes a player, they gave me all these narratives about ethics, about ambition, about perseverance, about critical thinking. Uh, actually, they, they talk about golf as if they were talking about chess, a game that requires a lot of mental uh, skills. No doubt, if you play this sport at a, high, uh, a, a very competitive level, you require a lot of analytical skills, but it is so in boxing, it is so in uh, cycling, swimming, and so on. All those sports will also require a lot of analytical skills when you're playing at a high competitive level. So there's nothing particular about this sport that makes it special for analytical uh, individuals. However, they were all, all of them talking about this is not the case about popular sports, this is the case about this uh, game. Also, I found this, the way in which segregation, the way in which the, the course was segregated, the club was segregated, in a very subtle way. In a way in which this segregation, in a way, gender segregation was putting the spotlight onto male players uh, and then removing from sight female players. Uh, after playing, and, and the importance of the bar is this, after playing a game, people move to the bar. And then the bar, unlike a regular bar, people intervene in the conversation in their tables. People make jokes and people hear the joke and then they remember about other players and so on. In multiple ways, the bar functions as this space that allows people to see through the course, despite not being present at the course. In the bar, they hear who is an amazing player, who is a really funny person, who is, has a really interesting conversation, who gets angry when he's uh, uh, losing, etc. The fact that women are not allowed to participate in the bar sort of reduces their visibility. They're just sort of removed from the main, main stage. Uh, and as such, that allowed some men to reproduce a narrative when I was asking them, why is it that women are not participating at golf at higher rates? They reproduce this narrative that women are not analytical, women are not aggressive, women are not, uh, they prefer to do some other things that uh, play in sports. Uh, so in multiple ways, the gender segregation allowed many males to assume that there's a natural division that by, w by way of our sex bodies, we are radically different. And as such, whereas male, we're in, we're be interested in participating in this sport, women will prefer to do things like taking care of their kids, uh, quote unquote, or uh, something like that. Then, I also found something that I didn't expect at the very beginning. Uh, if, if you recall, when I mentioned I was interested in class inequalities as my prime uh, lenses. However, I found something, a narrative that took me actually quite some time to make sense of what people were telling me. They constantly referred to caddies as people like them. When I was referring, they were like people like them and then make an explanation about why they were poor. Let me just bring that uh, people like them and the, and the way in which apparently they were using class narratives, class arguments whereas I will argue that they were not. These are pictures of golfers, which I took from magazines. These are not, none of them were part of the people who I interviewed. However, the people I interviewed were not different from them in any way. Uh, phenotypically, they were exactly like uh, these players. However, caddies were phenotypically like these uh, individuals. So when they were telling me that people like them, those at the bottom, don't make it in life, they are poor because they are uh, different. Some of them talk about food, which I mentioned before. Uh, I recall several people telling me, look what these people eat. You can only eat that and make it in life. When they were referring to food, they were making some sort of biological arguments. And those biological arguments have a long history uh, rooted in racial distinctions. They were constantly expressed metaphors to refer to, uh, to caddies in ways that they were expressing an essence. There's something inside these folks that make them prone to drink. They drink too much. Uh, that was a whole discussion of drinking. And of course, that discussion happened while we were drinking, which was the irony. Uh, so they drink a lot. 
they have no work ethic. Uh, you know what? They are not, they are not that intelligent. Uh, in fact, the most common argument I found among uh, players was they refer to uh, caddies as outsiders. These people don't understand the, the sport. I recall one player telling me they have no clue about this, this sport. This sport is so complicated that they cannot understand the beat of this game. So they constantly use all these narratives about uh, caddies that express a form of racialization of class, racial class. They never talk about skin color, by the way, never. The, the word white, brown, black was never ever mentioned. However, they constantly use metaphors that were equating these workers with uh, Indians or native uh, communities. Uh, I recall one of them telling me when I ask, why is it that the sport is not being... I ask about any attempt to make the sport more popular in order to bring more people and in order to uh, create more competition and so on. And he said, you know what, some, of, some golfers are uncomfortable with uh, players. Some of them think that if we, if courses, if clubs allow the big class to come, we're going to be flooded by uh, those guys from the Zapatista army. If you're not familiar, they were referring to the uh, uh, Zapatista army, which is a uh, group in the south that has a strong anti-capitalist, uh, a strong Indian pride uh, identity. Uh, so I heard these ideas that these guys are, are Indians, and we don't like them there. Only one name there, by the way, and it was after I stopped the recording, openly told me, once the recording was uh, uh, stopped, uh, you ask me why people don't like caddies, I will tell you off the record what I think. And it is because uh, caddies remind players of their mates and uh, drivers. And they don't like their mates, they don't like their drivers. That's the reason why they don't support them. Uh, so in multiple ways, they were using class to express racial metaphors. Now, if you know something, or let me just bring that, in Latin America, unlike the United States, class, since the foundation of the states in the 19th century, was never, or class equality was never a promise. It was never intention that we all are going to be equal, this idea of the American dream, and I will return to that in a second. The idea was, we may not be equal in class terms, however, in racial terms, we are equal. And this idea of racial democracy, uh, is present in multiple ways all throughout the region. Suddenly, by interviewing these upper, upper middle class uh, players, what I found is that their narratives were shattering the idea of racial democracy. They were in multiple ways arguing that they were in this position of privilege, not only because they were really hard, because they were, not only because the classical class uh, narrative about privilege, but they were also telling me because we are, in essence, different from these guys. That is what makes us different, and that is why they are poor, and we are not. Okay, so... So I started the project because of this. Um, social inequality. Following the Gini Index, the World Bank, uh, South Africa is the most unequal country in the world in terms of wealth distribution, and Mexico is number 19 out of 158 nations. So I was trying to understand that at the beginning. Uh, that was sort of my main motive. However, in the way I found that, that indeed class deeply shapes these communities. People were making jokes, and if, uh, if we have time in the q and I can elaborate more, more about jokes, about language, about fashion, and the way in which people were recognizing very small details to make distinctions between caddies and themselves. The way in which even tipping after eating in a restaurant was a sign of class. Uh, people were talking about that when, when I asked about uh, why uh, someone is not part of the community, why someone wealthy is not being accepted. Someone at some point told me, look how he tips. That is a, a, a sign of he's not part of us. But in the way I also found how gender inequalities were all the time articulated. Again, if you want, I can talk about sexuality and the way in which uh, some of these players use sexuality, particularly women, 
where they want policing uh, a sexuality, a sign of who is, who is part of the community and who's not, who, who's a respectable member of the community and who's not. And then the idea of racialization, the way in which class race was hidden behind class narrative, which in fact was a very powerful way of, uh, of reproducing racial narratives because in a context in which no mention of color is made, it apparently, uh, the, the, the whole narrative is about class, whereas I will, I will argue it is not. It is a way in which race is reproduced in a highly sophisticated way, a very effective way, because that, that sort of hides any trace of uh, racial narratives. So what I found at the end of, uh, of the research is that this intersectional uh, analysis uh, led me on earth the interlocking nature of power. How power is this about class, uh, as I argued or, or expected at the beginning, indeed, but it is also about gender and sexuality. The way with gender and sexuality is also used uh, to police the border of a community, and the way which race is reproduced to, again, keep making a very uh, uh, close understanding of who's a member of that community, who's, not, who's a legitimate member of the community, and who's not. Now, let me move here. What can educators learn from a study about privilege uh, in Mexico? Well, I will argue that the, the way in which my book will help educators is by calling you to turn around the rich perspective. Now, let me elaborate a bit more uh, about this point. Suddenly, we have all this data showing us that class inequalities in the United States are growing and keep growing and growing. So suddenly, this narrative about the American dream seems to be not supported by economic data. The economic data is showing us that that, that class gap keeps being expanded. When we look at the Gini index, the United States is 59 after 158 nations. So we are in the third uh, low, or we're closer to highly unequal societies than the other way around. When I present this piece of information to my students at Lehigh, I have heard some students telling me, you're talking about socialism. Uh, this idea of equality has to do with uh, socialist uh, countries, and we are not. We are rewarding people by their work ethic, the amount of work they put into their uh, uh, profession, and how they move up. However, I will insist that no. This has to do with the American dream. If the American dream is true, it has to do with making a, a level playing field in which we all start from a, a similar ground and then you're rewarded at the end of your life based on how hard you try it. Uh, but, but the data seems to suggest us that we need, we need to pay attention more to class and the way in which class shapes the experience of people in the classroom. The way in which class are limiting some people's opportunities uh, in life. But of course, when we keep looking uh, at the issue, it is not class itself, or it's not only class. We have the combination of class and race, and the way in which class and race collide in the same way that it collides in Mexico to try to generate these powerful narratives in which wealthy people think that they are there because they deserve it, because they try really hard, and those who are at the bottom can try really hard, and that is the reason why uh, these class inequalities exist. It seems that we have something similar in the United States, although I will argue that it's a slightly inverted uh, uh, curve. Whereas in Mexico, the idea is that everybody is racially equal. The idea in the United States is that class doesn't exist. And class is irrelevant, and we shouldn't pay attention. I insist. The data is telling us something different. Now, we know this as a fact. I'm not inventing anything. Those who fail are disproportionately low-income children. So we know that. We also know that those who are failing are also children of color or non-white communities. That's a statistical fact. And we also know as a statistical fact that those kids whose language is not, the first language is not English, are the ones who are struggling uh, in this context. Now, I know that some of my colleagues in, in the field of sociology of education 
they have explored these inequalities through the idea of cultural capital. They have used cultural capital to try to unearth the way in which uh, all these elements are depriving some kids from uh, moving up in the education system. But they have used the idea of uh, uh, cultural capital to explore some of class inequalities. However, it seems that the large body of work in sociolo sociology of education, looking at cultural capital, maybe in the same box I was talking about at the beginning, in which those kids are failing because they don't have cultural capital. Why they don't have cultural capital? Because they come from poor income families. Why they come from in poor in income families? Because they don't have friends with resources. Why they don't have friends with resources? Because they are poor. So it seems that we end up with the same trap that the uh, literature on, on social inequalities seems to be uh, uh, present. So we end up in a circle in which cultural capital or you're poor because you, you fell in school because you're poor, why you, you're poor because you fell in school, and so on. It seems like, like, like a tautological argument to make sense of, of the process. And I know that some of my colleagues in, in the solar education have developed this sort of literature on deficit in which the problem is the deficit of these communities. They don't know about art. They have no clue about music. They have no clue about books, etc. And that's the reason why they are failing in these settings. Uh, and then some of them have come up with some almost recipes. Like we need to teach these kids about art and that magically is going to solve uh, the issue. However, as in the early picture that I show you, I am asking you to, to turn around the argument, if these kids are failing, like Cadiz, someone else is benefiting greatly out of the system. If these kids, as in the case of Cadiz, are being left behind, that may be part of a larger process in which they are not there by themselves, or their schools are not independent units. But those schools may be connected uh, to a larger trend in which wealthier, wider communities may be greatly benefiting out of the whole process. So probably it is time to turn around the research perspective, uh, paying attention to those who greatly benefit of the system, those who are regarded as uh, highly successful cases. I know that uh, Richard Reeves at the Brookings Institute published a book, uh, 2017, arguing that those sociologists and social scientists interested in inequalities should look at the upper middle class. And his argument is very simple. When we try to understand inequalities, we have paid attention for a long time to the poor, to try to understand why people don't move up, and so on. He argues, we have been framing the, the problem in the wrong way. The upper middle class is that buffer class group between the 1% and the rest of the community that has the know-how or owns the know-how, possesses the, the know-how. They are the people who have the resources, who have the connections to actually mount very su successful campaigns against more progressive taxation, a more, more progressive school uh, policy, schooling policies, and so on. So his argument is, if we pay attention to those at the top, maybe we'll be able to move away uh, from the extremely simplistic arguments we have been making to explain poverty. And he's talking about poverty, not, not only education, it's poverty at large. Okay, I'm good. So, in that regard, I will argue that privilege requires to hide its own sources of power. It's almost like a magical trick almost this illusion. Uh, and there are some multiple social scientists talking about this sort of, we, we need to agree on this type of illusion, social illusion, uh, uh, to navigate society. So it seems that privilege requires to hide that, to, to pretend that it is not class advantage, it is not a racial advantage, but in many cases allowed some people to move up. Uh, and become highly successful individuals. Uh, so I will argue, and I will invite you, probably we need to try to look at privilege and try to turn around that perspective 
and explore the way in which those communities uh, which are making or having highly successful cases may be benefiting out of the process that excludes others. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so we have plenty of time, about 20 minutes, 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, I will raise it to the room first, but we'll also make sure if there are people online, please do chat your questions in and we'll make sure to ask them out in the class. Um, did you see a relationship between the golf course um, country club itself and the um, schools surrounding the golf course, particularly the you know, if you belong to this golf course, is it likely you belong to a specific school or your kids will go to a specific school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although the, the system in Mexico is slightly different from the system in the United States, uh, most middle class people will send their kids to private schools. The idea of being a private school is assumed to be better than, than any public. So people attending public schools are either lower middle class, working classes, or people with very progressive ideas about education. Otherwise, you will find uh, most middle upper middle class people sending their kids to uh, private schools. But in the case of education, what I found is that this is just one space. I wouldn't argue that golf is the space. It's just one space of the larger field of power. You will find a lot of connections, people moving around certain spaces. So you will find these people attending the same schools. And then some of them were talking about that, how they feel these clubs as a family. Uh, I recall a female member telling me, this is a family. You find the same people here in schools, at the universities. We know each other for a long time, and we bump into each other constantly. So it is this sort of spaces reproducing uh, privilege in multiple ways, not all of them in the same way, but you have this constant reproduction of uh, a sense of identity that is deeply rooted in a sense of privilege. Can you say a little bit more about the, the methods? Like, how, how did you, how, how many people did you talk to? Sounds like maybe they were all men. Um, okay, if I, if, if I can talk about methods of, of this research. Yes. Um, originally, I started, I ended up interviewing 58 uh, members of these clubs uh, and caddies. So sorry, it's 48 members, 10 caddies. Uh, the interviews with caddies were shorter. Uh, they tend to be, and that was something related to class, and I will elaborate a bit in, in a minute. Uh, they were, in multiple ways, intimidated in the way in which members were not, uh, in the way in which members were the other way around. Uh, I spent, I did my graduate school in the UK, and then I realized that if I speak with them for some time about London, or uh, even though I just didn't mention that I was in London as a grad student, and you know what that means, uh, poor, uh, but we were just talking about London, that suddenly they sort of cross me, they sort of racialized me in a way. They assumed like, you are one of us, and then they were uh, willing to talk. Um, I spent time mainly at three clubs, uh, although I talk with also members, uh, golf instructors who work in different clubs, uh, where I was asking them about the similarities. So what I, what I concluded is that <laughs> despite some differences in terms of style and uh, architectonic style, you have many similarities in the community. And in fact, uh, golfers talk about torments as this large family. They were using those those words. Um, I mainly spent time at the bar, uh, at the warming up area. So they were inviting me, and we were talking about that. Uh, most of the interview, interviews were recorded. Um, I could gain access, and that's part of I don't know if your question goes in that direction. The access I gained was through two elements my male identity. Uh, I chatted with some researchers who were female and they openly told me 
if you were, I, I have been denied access to these spaces because of my female identity. Um, and the second was the way in which I sort of, I was constantly making class. If I draw on the idea of uh, doing gender, I was doing class. I was trying to very openly convey this notion of uh, we know the same spaces, we know in order to build trust. Um, I was also using the idea of uh, golf and business uh, to open up discussions. And I realized that people were willing and excited to talk at large about business and golf. And after that, I was talking about asking them about caddies, why uh, middle class people couldn't uh, access these spaces. Uh, I should say that I wanted to get access to the most expensive club in the city, a club that charges $150,000 to become a member. Uh, I also realized that my way of doing class also reached a limit. Uh, and the limit was very few upper, upper class people uh, were excited about that. Uh, the upper middle class was okay, but when I was trying to constantly gain, asking people to put me in contact, with these exclusively upper class communities, they were saying that they didn't have friends, which I doubted because they were telling about more about the larger community. Uh, so if, if that makes yeah. thank you. And, and let me just mention something. There's a in, in the book I, I include a chapter about methodology, which by the way, if someone is interested in the book, uh, if you want to use this uh, promotion code, you can save thirty percent off. But I'm making a very controversial argument uh, about studying up. And my argument is this. In the field of sociology, we developed a code of conduct mainly to protect powerless communities. Uh, and since that code of conduct was developed in the late 1950s, it started a discussion about, but this doesn't apply to powerful groups. However, the discussion has been off, on and off, on and off, on and off, and there's no resolution. The code of conduct is the same. However, if we are trying to gain access to these communities and try to show a roadmap uh, to turn around some of the ways in which privilege allowed some of these communities to, to, to gain a lot of resources, I'm not completely convinced that the code of conduct works in that way because according to the code of conduct, I should give them access to the last uh, uh, manuscript and allow them to decide which parts they were not happy with and then drop some of these, uh, some of the interviews, some of the arguments, or at least acknowledge that, that some of the people were not happy with that. If my overall argument or my overall goal is to try to think around this, this inequality, to try to, to, to provide elements for policymakers to, to turn around this, I will argue that probably we need to think that code of conduct when we study up. It's a highly controversial argument. Uh, I, I'm very clear of that, but I will still argue that we need to, to think about that uh, kind of ethics, uh, doing research with highly powerful individuals. And in no way, and don't get me wrong, in no way I'm saying that uh, I sh we shouldn't respect their privacy. Uh, in no way I'm, I'm saying that we should be respect. Uh, all the names uh, were omitted. Many, many cases were <coughs> included because the, people was, or the person was so famous that by including some elements, people will immediately recognize the person. So I decided to uh, remove that from the book. However, I think that we need to to think how we approach power if we want to transform it. Uh, could you expound a little bit more about this idea of cultural capital deficit and also within that cultural capital deficit, was it more from a gendered culture perspective? You know, were there, did you get information from women as far as, because you mentioned that women were like gatekeepers for uh, how they're viewed as far as their their um, sexuality, I think is, is, is how you mentioned it, would be denied at the bar. Could you explain a little bit about uh, 
that aspect of your research? So let, let me just divide that, that answer into two things. On the one hand, the issue of sexuality. When I was talking with women about inequality, I recall that most of them complained that the playing time at these clubs was not organized for the playing skills. They argued that would be the fair way to do it. You are a good player, it doesn't matter if you are female or male, you can uh, play early in the morning. You are a so social player, a bad player, go on and play in the afternoon. That was a complaint. However, after complaining about this, and I recall one case in which was very uh, vocal, complaining for a long time about these inequalities, and she was bringing the point that I am better than, most than more than half of the men in this uh, club. I can easily defeat 60% uh, of these uh, males. However, they don't let me play. And then she started talking about a famous Mexican professional player as a way to, to show, like, look, women are not in fear that men. Look, that player. And then at some point, she shifted the, the discussion, saying, oh, by the way, and she's not lesbian. Uh, and then, then, then she started talking about, you know, well, these, uh, most of the f uh, professional female players are lesbian. Look at their muscles. Look how muscular they are, how strong they are. And then she went on and on and on. Uh, in a way, she brought this, this issue of policing sexual identity as a way to show who was a respectable member of the community and who was not, uh, in a way that no single male ever talked about uh, that. So it seems that, that she was more inclined to, to, to make that distinction, trying to equate or trying to show that women could make it, but they are not uh, uh, lesbians uh, and as such. Keep this issue of respectability uh, and, and, and gender uh, norms very fair. Uh, the issue of cultural capital deficit, it is that in the sociology of education, you will have a large body of work on cultural capital. This idea that kids who is the Bourdieu's idea that uh, the distinction between working class kids and middle class, from middle class kids or the success of one group and the lack of success of the other rest on the cultural capital that middle class or middle class kids have. The way in which they, since an early age, uh, by the way of uh, education at home, learn something about literature, something about art, something about music, something about how to express ideas, something about how to address a figure of authority, and how those very simple and mundane <coughs> elements allow those kids to connect better with teachers, allow them to find mentors uh, in, a, in a fastest and easier way, uh, allow them to navigate uh, difficult situations without jeopardizing, jeopardizing or, or, or uh, putting their own position in a, in a putting themselves in a vulnerable position. Uh, and the working class kids do not have these resources with them. Uh, and that's the reason why they fail in larger proportions. Therefore, Part of this, part of Bourdieu's intention, and he's very open about that, he was trying to express the way in which inequalities were articulated in the school uh, system. He was not trying to blame uh, poor kids. He was trying to show, like, this is how, uh, uh, here you have a uh, tool to sort of explore uh, inequalities in a more subtle way. However, in the sociology of education, you will find people using the concept to, to and it seems to me, in some cases, I wouldn't say in all the cases, but in many cases, you have this as a, as a tool that enter in this cycle in which the explanation of poverty, it is because they lack cultural capital. And then they end up with a sort of literature or body of work about deficit. The problem of these kids is, is that they are academically deficient. There's something wrong with the kids rather than it is the system, uh, how it works, how they, the system is excluding them on purpose, uh, not that necessarily is, is wrong with them. So my, my argument will be probably to try to move away from that argument that it is, the problem is within them, within those communities. Probably we need to put those communities alongside those other communities which really, really benefit out of the, 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 the interaction. I think we have time for maybe one more question. And if there's anyone online, please chat your question. Uh, 
I have another question. <laughs> Please. Uh, do you find that the scenarios in which you, or the conditions in which your research was, was done, uh, do you think this is typical of the relationship between the wealthy and the poor, from the poor neighborhoods just in general in Mexico, or is it more specific to a region? I think that this, the relationship between the poor and the wealthy, there are, there are very few research conducted on other settings uh, about the wealthy. Not only in Mexico, in the United States and the United Kingdom, you have the same issue. There's very few, and it is, uh, as the question probably asked, is it is an issue of access, uh, what prevents most <laughs> social scientists from researching these uh, settings. The way in which these communities understand very well the value of information. The way in which, when I was in interviews, people constantly pause before giving me an answer. They were very careful about how they presented, even if they were complaining about their uh, colleagues, they were very careful thinking about how I'm going to complain about a colleague, uh, how I'm going to, to talk about uh, 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 workers. Uh, so there's very few research. The very few research conducted on other spaces aligns with this idea that privileged people internalize a sense of themselves that they present their success not in terms of some of the advantages that they have since the very beginning, but mainly in terms of their work ethic, <coughs> their intelligence, their um, their ability to overcome uh, difficult situations. Uh, so they're constantly framing themselves as, I am special, and that's the reason why I'm here. The reason why those other folks are not here are because they are not special. That is something that appears in uh, other research, in the, in the very few research conducted in the country, this element is completely uh, present. So I would argue that in this case, or the uh, specificities of this case, it's shown how that narrative is reproduced through sports. Uh, I guess, but well, that's a guessing, that if I move at uh, elite universities, people will reproduce the narrative of I'm special, although they will root or they will use elements of the education <laughs> system to explain why they are special. Uh, if I move to uh, the world of politics and I move to the uh, politicians, probably they will use some other type of uh, argument to explain how they, they are so smart to deliver policy. I, I don't know what, but, 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 but that element is, is present in the body of work looking at uh, why people, how people in this settings understand their own position. Well, thank you very much for those of you online and those of you in the room. Um, we you. have um, a very brief announcement um, about an activity next week. Did you want to jump in? Okay. Come on, um, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, Rebecca, you can jump in. But, um, I just wanted to announce that we'll be having a um, film screening with the director of the film next Wednesday. So that's June 22nd. He'll be in this same room. No, January, sorry. January. <laughs> January 22nd in this uh, same room um, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And also it'll be available streaming online. Uh, the film is called Nowhere to Call Home. Um, and it is a story uh, about a migrant from Tibet having helping her son find sort of schooling in Beijing, and it's part uh, an urban story and then part of the <laughs> Tibetan village. The filmmaker, Jocelyn Ford, uh, worked um, in Beijing and in Tokyo um, um, for, I think, the National Public Radio, and she uh, is the director and creator of the film, and so she'll be here doing a question and answer afterwards. So if you're interested in broad theories of globalization, uh, migration, uh, schooling decisions that families have to make in inequality, please come join us to see the film next Wednesday, January 22nd <laughs> at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. And also next month, we have our next colloquium, which is on uh, capturing education through uh, social movements in Brazil and the landless uh, movement. So we welcome you all back. And again, a big thank you. Thank you. Thank you.